my dad who um, had respiratory distress. He had to go to ER. And I prayed over him. Praise God. God answered. My dad's home now, so God hears us. So as I lead you in prayer, I'm going to give you a moment of silence to be able to open up your heart and meet with God. Let him know what's on your heart. He cares. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what your son Jesus has done on the cross for us, Lord. Not only has Jesus laid down his life to pay for the sin death that we all deserve, not only that, Lord, you've asked us to put down our old life, put away the old man, put away the selfish desire, and be born again in new life the resurrected life of Jesus Christ living in us by the power of his spirit, Lord. We are now children of the God Most High, the creator of the universe, the God Almighty who has control of all things. We can come to you boldly to the throne of grace. Lord, I thank you so much. Not only do you hear our prayer, but you deeply are concerned with each and every one of us, that you know our names. You know where we are, and you desire, Lord, to care and provide for us. Above all things, you have given us you. God of all creation is with us, full of power, full of authority, that we are loved and significant and secure. And Lord, while the world tries to scramble and tries to be busy and tries to gather up things to find significance and security, our security is in you. It's in you. When we have you, we have it all. Father, I pray that you would help us to make that truth come so true and deep into us, Lord, of our very being, that we belong to you as children of God. Precious, pay for with a great price. And that we, Lord, when we have you, we've got it all. We can bring all things to you, Lord, and you hear us. And Lord, more importantly, align our desire with that of yours. Lord, you saved us for a reason, not just for us, but to be shared with the world, that you would overflow in and out of us so that we can pour out and be the feet and hand of Jesus to a world that desperately needs you, Lord. So Lord, help us. Help us recognize what you have done for us and what, who lives in us that we can go out and pour out and love those around us. And Lord, pray for our enemies. Love our neighbors. Father, help us not be caught in a busyness of today's world where the, the world tells us you need to be busy. The world tells you that we need to be gathering more. And the world tells us we need to do all this and all that. Father, Help us to do what is better than the good. That is choosing you first and foremost in our lives. That we, Lord, fight jealously and intimately for you to spend time face with you, Lord. Not for your hands, but your face. To seek you deeply. To refresh and replenish from you, Lord. To have our minds renewed and to put in proper perspective of how you see the world, how you see others, how you see us. Father, we need you. 
We need the power of your Holy Spirit and outpouring. The, we need you, Lord, to be filling each of every one of us that we experience you in such a fresh and a new way, Lord, that we do not be of this world to see the worry and the struggle, but we see hope and we know we have power, Lord. And out of that, Lord, we can be a light, be a blessing to love onto others, Lord, and to have a peace that guards our heart and our mind, despite what's going on in this world, Lord. Lord, rise us up as your people, Lord. Pour out your spirit and start with us here, Lord. And Lord, if there's anything, search us that is not in keeping in line with you. Start with our mind, Lord. The devil's lies, Lord, break them. Break the chains. And Father, I want to pray those who are mourning this morning, who have, who is deeply missing a loved one. And Lord, help us draw close to you. Be, receive your comfort, Lord, knowing that this is not the end, Lord. That this, we're here only for a short time. That your time is eternity. So Father, I ask that you would just comfort those that are in mourning this morning, Lord to just encourage them that, Lord, they will see their loved one again. And Father, I want to pray for marriages this morning, Lord, families, Lord. Lord, there is a spiritual battle that is not of flesh and blood, lies and deception that turns husband and wife against each other through lies. Lord, I pray for a breaking of that. I pray, Lord, that they will bring, be brought back to you, focus on you, Lord. A love from you that transcends and repairs and restored. And Lord, I pray that you would help each of us to be slow to speak but quick to listen. And that, Lord, we are humble in our spirit, that we are teachable and that we're willing to forgive quickly. Not for the others, but for ourselves so that that rot does not take a root, Lord. Lord, help us take all our thoughts captive, Lord, when those negative things are, are that we hear in the news, Lord, we hear them, that we do not let that take root, that we replace it with praise and worship of who you are, that you've overcome. Lord, our hope is in you today. Lord, I thank you that as children of God, we're privileged, we're cared by God Almighty whose power, who has a plan and purpose for each and every one of us, Lord. Let us be in your will. Thank you that we get to partake in that kingdom work, Lord, as children of God. Lord, help us be powerful in the way we live that's different from this world. And Lord, help us be different. So Lord, I thank you again. What a privilege it is to come before the great almighty God in, in prayer and petition, but thanksgiving. We have a peace that's not of this world, but it's from you. Lord, each person that's here, Lord, I pray that you hear their prayers, Lord, that you would meet with them in a fresh and a new and intimate way, that they would know that you are as real as this air in this room. And Lord, you are near to us. It's us that have not been near to you, so draw us near to you. Lord, I long for a revival, an outpouring of your spirit that replicates using your people here using your church, that we be a powerful witness in the world, bringing the light of Jesus and the gospel that Jesus is for them as well. So Lord, help us remember that when we want to speak poorly about someone or that we remember that you desire a relationship with them as well and that you are choosing to work through us who has received you as our Lord and Savior. Thank you again. We love you, Jesus. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Rob, and I'm the senior pastor here at First Baptist Church. We are in the midst of a, a series on heresy, 
And today is our small is our uh, our last uh, day in the series. And so, um, until now, our small groups have lined up with our sermon series, and that is about to change. So, if you are interested in joining a small group, uh, this is the perfect opportunity to do so because every small group in the church is transitioning this week from this series to something new, and they're all doing something different. And so, if you are interested in joining a small group, we have room in a lot of them. There's a lot of spots where there's at least enough room uh, to add maybe a couple more people, um, but we, uh, we do have room and opportunity for that to happen. Am I on or am I yelling at you? I'm on. Okay. Sorry, when I was a sound person, I hated it when the speaker did that. Made everyone look back at you and act like you're not doing your job. Sorry, Blair. Um, small groups. It's perfect time to sign up. So if you're interested in a small group, now is the time. I feel like in this series, one of the things that I haven't done well is to go back and remind us why I think the conversation is important. And the reason it's important to talk about heresies is because they affect how we think and feel about Jesus Christ. They affect how we feel about our Savior. And so when we have a misunderstanding about who Jesus is or who the church is or what he did for us, it affects how we see him. I also forget to go back and remind us that perfection in theology is not required for relationship with Christ. That you can be saved and have imperfect theology. And I know that because I've been wrong in the past and I am probably wrong about something in my way of thinking now and I will have that changed by God in the future. That process is called sanctification. Sanctification is a changing of what we believe and think about ourselves and about the world. And it's something that God does within us. And if God is changing us, it means that we're moving from something that is less perfect to something that is more perfect. And is that, if that is happening, one of the things we have to admit is that the position we're in now is hopefully less perfect than the position we'll be in the future that God will deal with the sins and misunderstandings in our lives. And so perfection in understanding is not required, but our misunderstandings do affect how we see God, which is why it's important to address them today. So why did I pick the one I did? Because I think it has a lot of practical outpourings on you and me. And so today I want to talk about Christian nationalism and cultural Christianity. Don't worry, I'll define those terms and help you understand them. So these are two things that have to do with how you and I interact with the government in which we're under, with our nation, with our nationality, with Canada for us and to our neighbors to the south, who we talk about a whole lot more in these conversations, to this idea of American Christianity. And so Christian nationalism is when you tie the gospel to a political or tribal goal. So when you take Jesus Christ and the salvation in which he brings and tie it to a political party, why is that dangerous? The risks are huge. For starts, it's a lie. I don't think God ordained one political party to be above the rest. The second is that it ties the perfect gospel to imperfect leaders and imperfect ideas. And so it takes this perfect person of Christ and ties it to something that is often corrupt. And in doing so, we do a disservice to the gospel and we misrepresent Christ to the world. One of the final things that I think Christian nationalism places a risk on us is that it places our hope in something that will ultimately fail. What we know when we look at world history is that no nation lasts forever that eventually it gets turned over and a new government comes into being and a new group takes over leadership. How much better is it to place our hope in something that's eternal? This is why when Christ was addressing Pilate, he reminded Pilate that his kingdom is not of this world. That this is not where he's setting up shop and making, making his permanent residence. But that he was going to produce something far better than what we see around us. And so when we, put our, when we place our hope in our national leaders, in those around us, in our identity as, as people who live in a certain nation, it places our hope in the wrong spot. So Christian nationalism is one side to a two-sided 
coin. It ties the gospel to a political or tribal idea. Cultural Christianity happens when the draw of becoming a Christian comes from the societal advances it brings. And again, I'll help you with this. When we make it a requirement to be a Christian in order to advance in society, to do well, for your business to succeed, for you to become a judge or a lawyer, or for you to be a political leader, whether that's in an official capacity and that we write it down in the rules or in an unofficial way and that we only go to stores where there's a Christian who owns the store or we only elect those that we think are Christians. What it does is it makes it so that you have a lot of fake Christians. A lot of people who acknowledge Christ for the sole sake of advancing their business or acknowledge Christ for the sole sake of wanting to be a judge or a lawyer or acknowledge Christ for the sole sake of advancing their political career. And it muddies up the church. It brings a whole lot of of people with, with inappropriate motivation for their allegiance to Christ. They're not convictional Christians, they're cultural Christians. Convictional Christians are those with a deep commitment to the teaching of Jesus who want to be transformed by it. And this is what we want to see in the church. Those that have a deep connection to Jesus that are changed by who he is. Not that are here because if they don't come, people won't buy their stuff. And these two ideas have come and gone throughout the church's history. I think it's actually one of the very first histories, the very first heresies that the church addressed along with a few others. Within the early church, within scripture, we read how there was a group called the Judaizers. This was a group that said, in order to be a Christian, what you need to do is join our tribe, become part of our people group, join our nation even. You had to be circumcised and eat the food. You had to become part of the nation of Israel in order to be saved in this group's eyes. The name Judaizer comes from Galatians 2.14. I'm going to jump around between a few scriptures in today's sermon. More often than not, I preach quite exegetically. I take a text and we go through it verse by verse. Today we're moving through a few different different texts. But one of the primary ones I'm focusing on is Galatians 2.14. And in this one, uh, it's Paul speaking and he says, When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? That literal phrase is to to Judaize, to become like Jews. So how are you requiring those that are becoming Christians to take on the customs of Judaism? Why is that something that you're adding on to them? Now, this changing an understanding of what it was to be part of the the fellowship of God, what it is to be part of the kingdom of God, was a redefining that was taking place. They were redefining what makes someone a part of God's chosen people. And this wasn't a change of plans for God. This wasn't a surprise for him. This wasn't something that he did on a whim. This was always God's intention. And he foreshadowed this in the things in the Old Testament, in the way he spoke about Israel and to Israel, in the things that he did. He said, I'm giving you this example of Israel because I'm going to do something greater in the future. And so there became this idea that it's not an allegiance to the nation of Israel that defines who is a, who is a follower of God but there's another kingdom at work that requires many of the same things that was required to be a nation of Israel, but in an altered way. Christ's death and resurrection changed so much in this world. Romans 2 verse 25 to 29 speaks about some of this change and some of the concern that they had for those that were calling people to become Jewish in order to accept Christ. Romans 2 verse 25. Circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you've become as though you had not been circumcised. So then if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirement, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who even though you have the written code and are circumcised are a lawbreaker. A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one is inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, 
not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. So why was Judaism such a big deal? Because they were essentially saying that our salvation is found in our actions and in our allegiance to a nation. There was an elitism to what they were preaching about the cross that was not true. And we see this throughout ages. We even see it in our language. And so in the centuries that follow, we see that there was the the Christian Romans versus the heathen barbarians. There, There were the Europeans versus the northern heathen tribes. And I think we still make those distinctions, at least in our mind today. And we do it when we talk about other nations. It's ironic that there's more Christians in China than there are in USA today. And yet, what do we speak about, Chris, about China as a nation and about the U.S. as a nation? Now, surely their governments are different, and one is horrific. I'm not denying that. But in our language, we often talk as if we've arrived and they haven't. There's still this outreach group that is just beginning their faith journey and need all our help, and we have it all together. Or when we talk about First Nations in our own country, do we... Do we expose that same kind of thinking? That we've arrived and they haven't? That we're taking Jesus to the reserve even though it's been there much longer? He's been there much longer than he has in many of our own homes? We have generations of believers on reserves and yet we act like, we act like they haven't seen or heard the message often. And in some ways that can be good, but it's bizarre that we treat a First Nation reserve like a mission field and our neighborhood like a group of Christians that have gathered together in a city. We do this when we go on mission trips too. I'm amazed how often I go on a mission trip for evangelistic purposes. I do this. So I'm not, uh, I hear that there's some uh, self-understanding in this. We go on mission trips as if we're taking Jesus to places that have had Christians located there for much longer than our own faith has been around. And we get this nationalistic understanding of what Christianity is, that there's Christian nations and non-Christian nations, that there's places where Jesus has been revealed and places where he's been hidden. And some ways there is truth to that, but in some ways there's elitism to it. Like the more developed nations or the more advanced nations have Christ and those who are not developed don't. At a conference this weekend, I had someone remind me that there are more Anglicans today in any of Nigeria, Uganda, or Sudan than there are in England, Australia, and Canada combined. Pick one of those countries. There's more Anglicans in any of those countries than there is in England, Australia, and Canada combined. One of the bizarrenesses of the world we're in is that the nations that want to claim that they are Christian nations are often the ones in which the church is failing or diminishing. And those that we have often referred to as heathens, Christianity is thriving. Well, let's come back to us. We like talking about us. What does this mean for us? It means that identifying as a Christian will happen less, but those who do will be more committed. We've seen that in our country, the, uh, the group that would be identified as cultural Christians is decreasing. There is less advantage in society today to being a Christian. And it means that cultural Christians are on the decline in our country. There's less people that accept, that want to be part of the Christian church for the sake of advancing their economic goals or their political goals or their, their worldly goals. And some have seen that as a shrinking of the church rather than recognizing that it just means that there's a group that we're here for all the wrong reasons that has moved aside now. So identifying as a Christian will happen less, but those who do will be more committed. Bruce Gerzner talks about it this way. He says, there is a cultural form of Christianity that permeates virtually every aspect of our society. Country singers win awards for songs about cheating on a spouse, and they thank the Christian God for winning the award. Boxers and MMA fighters brutalize one another and then thank God for the strength to do what they do. 
Prayers are uttered under their breath at sporting events by both teams, while players give testimony to faith in Jesus, and the Christian God is given all the credit for their success. One need not look very hard to find Jesus in these places. Cultural Christianity is all about what people say and not what they do. This is the predominant form of Christianity in America, Bruce says. When asked, do you believe in the Christian God, most Americans will say yes. It matters not how they live or even if they understand Christian doctrine. They believe and that's all that matters. It might be interesting for you to know that Bruce uh, was a pastor who became an atheist. That his misunderstanding of who was a Christian and who was not caused him to walk away from Christ. The cultural Christianity is not convictional Christianity. There is a difference between the two. And that there are convictional Christians in the world today. Now again, we see some of this cultural Christianity and this nationalistic Christianity much easier to the south. There is a movement in the South that has worked hard to combine combine Jesus and political parties. And it's been worrisome to watch from north of the border. And certainly we have some flavors of it here, but not at the same level. So at a a QAnon rally, which was attended by members of Trump's family, one of the people who prayed said, Father God, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Jesus. We're asking you to open the eyes of President Trump's understanding that he will know the time of divine intervention. He will know how to implement it. And you will surround him, Father, with none of this deep state trash people, none of this rhino trash people. You'll surround him with the people that you pick with your own mighty hand. Isn't that a little bizarre? But how do you speak to God and pray in his name and call people trash? And those that were present mostly stood and clapped as if it was the wisest thing they'd ever heard. Now don't get me wrong, we're called to pray for our country and for our leaders. I even encourage people to go into politics. We want Christians in political places, but we can't tie the message of Christ to those people or to their movement. At another rally, the pastor that was opening said, so we pray, Father in heaven, we firmly believe that Donald Trump is current and true president of the United States. How damaging is it to tie a political agenda to the cross of Christ? When you tie salvation to anything other than Jesus, it does not work. It's sacrilegious and it profanes the name and the work of Christ. Christ didn't come to establish a nation here on earth. He came to advance his kingdom that is not of this world. And when we tie him to these things, we do a disservice to the message of God. So we've talked a little bit about some of the shifts that we see in culture. And I am hopeful for some of them. I think they do have potential in our country in particular to bring about good effect. The theologian wrote, the lasting effects of these shifts will force churches to make a critical decision that will either become a cultural church that allows the societal trends to dictate their ever-changing beliefs, or they will become a counter-cultural church that faithfully adheres to scripture and proclaims the gospel in a carefully considered way. The latter church will offer real hope in the midst of an adversarial culture and is the only real future for the North American church. I do take hope that some of the shifts are identifying Christ followers. That they're drawing lines in the sand. That because it's no longer favorable in our culture to be part of a church, but even looked down upon or condemned. Because there's a cost to being here today and a greater cost yet to come, I believe, if if our nation continues on the trajectory it's on. I think it draws those into this place that are more attuned with the Spirit, that are here for the right reasons, that are striving to know and understand Christ, that aren't coming because it helps their business or advances their political agenda. And that offers me great hope. And so I would encourage you to examine 
your connection to the things of this world? Are you focused on the things of Christ? Are you focused on the things that are eternal? Have you tied your faith to a cultural understanding? Have you tied Christ to a nationalistic understanding? I think in all of these things, there is a, a need for us to be present in the world. We need to be careful that we don't misrepresent Christ when we're there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, in Colossians, um, Paul reveals that the things of this world, these, these things that we can do of religious nature are a shadow of the things to come, that the reality is found in Christ. Lord, I pray that we would be focused on you and on your son, that our hearts would be drawn into this world for the sake of telling others about who you are, about advancing your kingdom, not advancing our own goals or our own desires. Lord, may you continue to transform and change us, to sanctify us, to rework our thoughts, to rewire even how our brains approach things in order to be more like you and your son, in order to understand right and wrong, in order to be wise, in order to recognize where our misunderstandings, our, our false beliefs in our own hearts have changed how we see you, have altered the truth of who you are, have made the message of the gospel less offensive but less true, have allowed us to continue in our sin rather than addressing it at the cross. God, I believe that you have good things for this world, but I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't be caught up in focusing on advancing them to the negligence of advancing the message of the cross. In your name we pray. Amen. Call on the worship team to come lead us once again. We'll end with the King of Kings.